Hi, welcome. Welcome to my presentation. I'm very happy to be here again for the third time. So, first of all, hello Lviv. Privit, Lviv. Um, how many of you have been here? <laughs> how many of you have been here last year? Raise your hand. Damn. <laughs> That's a problem because last year I promised I learned some more Ukrainian and I haven't, so sorry. <laughs> okay, so it's great to see you again for the first time. And let's go with the presentation. So, I don't want this to be an ordinary, regular, boring presentation. I want to do something a bit different. I want to play a game. And now, probably, as most of you have been here last year, it's like, again? I did the exactly same presentation last year, so are we having the, the same thing again? Well, the answer is no. We are going to play a game again, not like in the Saw movie, not again. <laughs> So, no flat blood and flesh frying everywhere, nothing like this. Again, we are going to play something more pleasant, but today, today we go retro. Today we go, today we go retro, we go to, back to the 80s. Um, I don't know, I know that calling things from the 80s a retro, you know, probably most of us are from the 80s. And okay, for computer games this is definitely retro. So there will be like plenty of pixel art, plenty of 80s old school characters and so on. And probably you've noticed a one small difference, right? Because on the first slide, the title of the presentation was Seven Deadly Sins, right? Seven Deadly Sins. And in the Bible, there are seven deadly sins. But in the agenda, there are seven deadlier sins. Any idea why? You know, I get inspired a lot by movies, TV shows, cartoons, and so on. So guess what I've been watching last year? Stranger Things, of course. So, deadlier sins today, seven deadlier sins of quality. And Stranger Things, who haven't seen that? Who hasn't seen that? Definitely you should see this TV series, it's amazing. But if you haven't seen that, that's fine. No problem. It won't affect, you know, the main message. Okay, so seven deadly sins of quality, seven deadlier sins of quality. We are going to Stranger Things world. We are having Stranger Things team. So, just like in Stranger Things, we'll have our team. We'll have a team and we'll go for a small adventure game. Okay, so let's meet our team. Just like in Stranger Things, we will have four main characters. First, Lucas. Lucas, L for, let's give him some role. Who can Lucas be? L stands for, not loser, leader. Okay, Lucas is a leader. Then we have Mike. M for, manager, obviously, the bad one. <laughs> okay, next we have D, Dustin. D for developer, obviously, you hated ones in here. And last but not least, the most important person today for us is 11. E stands for what? But E, E, E for? Nah, this will be too easy. And I have the problem as well. I haven't had any idea what to do with 11. So, E for what, right? And I started to think and think and think, and I saw that, okay, if you play a little bit with letters, you get Evelyn. And I checked it. Evelyn is actually a Ukrainian name, right? So it fits pretty well. No? It was in the dictionary. <laughs> so, but we have Evelina. For sure it's a Polish name. But I also checked in Ukrainian. But Evelina still is like, who is she, right? So I decided to make it a little bit nicer for small Evelina and to fit actually almost te every testing meetup in the world. So this will be today our little small Evelinka. And Evelinka is... <laughs> you have the Ukrainka meetup and so on, so it fits. So Evelinka is obviously the QA. And she's the most important person today. From her perspective, we'll be having our adventure. We'll be going from one level to another, meeting different characters and trying to learn from them from Evelinka's perspective, from QA perspective. Looking, we'll be talking about some psychology, some cognitive biases, so we'll be talking how these things influence our mind, our decision making as QAs, and so on, and so imply, impact the quality of our product. So you guys, if you are ready, let our adventure begin. Chapter 1, Pride. The first deadly sin, the pride. In every chapter, we, as I said, we'll meet a character. So, uh, anyone played Pokemon? You probably recognize that. 
Okay, so in every chapter we meet a character that is representing this single deadly sin. So who can be a very great example of pride? Who was super proud, so confident, and that even cocky? I was a developer, come on. <laughs> Please don't punish me so publicly. <laughs> okay, who can we meet in here? From the world of movies, TV series, and so on? No, but from TV shows. He was mean, not, <laughs> not confident, maybe. Oh, maybe. Okay, but there is one guy that's definitely the most cocky one in, in the world. And this is? Sheldon Cooper. So Sheldon Cooper appears, right? Yep. Bazinga. So we meet Dr. Sheldon Cooper. This guy was so confident, right? He was so cocky. He thought he knows everything. Right? And probably this meme is the best proof for that, right? My brain is better than everybody's. He thought he was so smart. He thought he knows everything. But actually, if you watch Big Bang Theory, well, it wasn't always true, right? Because there was this moment, there were these moments that he was like thinking that he knows something, but it didn't come out to be true. And there was this like moments like saying, what? <laughs> like, I'm not right, not possible. And I want to share a quote with you in here. So the quote is, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's illusion of knowledge. Any idea who said that? No? It was... Stephen Hawking, who unfortunately recently this year he passed away. So, and how smart this quote is. Because if you are an ignorant, if you don't have the knowledge and you are fine with that, okay, that's your choice. You won't make any stupid decision based on this. But if you think you have knowledge and you're wrong, you can make a decision that will be harmful. And this is illusion of knowledge as well as illusion of experience in psychology. These are cognitive biases that affect our brain every day, all the time. We think we know, we think we have experience, but usually this is just our opinion, this is just our assumption, and we can make wrong decisions based on opinions. So the learning from our chapter, the learning from this chapter, chapter number one is that your ideas may be based on opinions, because you think you have the knowledge, you think you have the experience, but these are just illusions. And you can make a wrong decision just because of that. Chapter number one done. Let's go to chapter number two. Greed. Who can we meet in here? Who is a perfect example of really greedy guy? From The Simpsons, one of my favorites, Mr. Burns. Like the stereotype of a manager, right? Excellent. The one who wants to take all your money and drain your blood. Right? So we meet Mr. Burns. Mr. Burns loved this. Right? It's all mine. He wanted all the gold, all the money. But I don't want to talk about money in here because this is, you know, like a delicate subject. I want to talk about something a bit different. Because not the money, but guys, we have this kind of our treasures, right? In our IT world, in our project, we have these cool things, these small treasures of the IT. This can be, I don't know, some Greenfield project, checking some new fancy tool, maybe doing a demo for a client, and you know, improving your visibility. And we are, when we are taking this cool task, you know, we feel like, feel like a kid in the candy store, super happy, yeah, we are doing the cool stuff. And we want this, we want this for us. But the problem is that there is another effect that comes into play. And this image should probably help you. Not very fancy, right? And I'm going to talk to you about the cheerleader effect. And the cheerleader effect, probably some of you will say straight away, like, what? That's not it. Cheerleader effect was some stupid theory from TV series. But actually, no, there is in psychology, there is a thing called cheerleader effect. And it's proven in some environments that it works. What is it about? The cheerleader effect in general says, then in a group, we seem more attractive, physically attractive. We seem more attractive in a group than on our own. But I don't want to talk in here about attractiveness. I don't want to talk who's pretty, who's not, right? So let's change this a little bit. Let's change it to cheerleader effect by Tomasz Dubikowski, not backed up by any research, right? This is just my theory. I want to share it with you. So let's change this word attractive and say that simply, in a group, we seem more awesome. Ah, why? Because, guys, we are not working in the Wild West. This is not the Wild West. We don't work alone. 
We work in teams, right? We work together. And if you want to achieve something, if you have this idea on your own, you're trying to achieve it on your own, that's not enough. If you can bring people together, if you can create a team working together, sharing the same goal, then you can achieve much more. So the learning from here is that you may not achieve all you want on your own. Plus, if you are taking all the cool stuff, your team will hate you and will end up forever alone. Sorry. Chapter number two done. Let's go to chapter number three. Lust. Who can we meet in here again? Who is a very good example of a very, very lustful guy? Any ideas? I've heard it. Louder. Huh? Shy? <laughs> okay, so in here we meet, of course, Barney Stinson. Barney Stinson, who was absolutely awesome, right? I am awesome. Barney Stinson was an example of a really lustful guy, right? He wanted everything. He wanted everything. He was picking up all the ladies he met. He wanted the best suits. He wanted the money. He wanted the fame. He wanted everything. But then when you look, if you watched How I Met Your Mother, you see that actually why he wanted all this. Why did he want all this? Because it wasn't giving him happiness. He was looking for true love. So why he... Well... Anything? <laughs> okay. Just a little pause, right? Anyone knows any good joke? <laughs> I think it's working. Perfect. Okay. So, back to presentation. So, why he wanted all this, right? You can you can think because this maybe this slide is somehow bugged. <laughs> all right, let's try the next one. Fancy. Okay. So, why he wanted all this? That's a good question because it wasn't giving him happiness, right? He was looking for true love. So, why he was doing this? Because he's seen, he has seen another people having money, picking up girls, who seemed to be happy. And he was trying to do the same, to achieve the same result. And this, in psychology, is called the cargo cult. And I don't know if you've heard this story. This is a phenomenon for me. Who hasn't heard about this? Most of you have, hasn't. You don't know it. Okay, so I'll tell you. Okay. So we have to go back to the Second World War when Americans were fighting Japanese on the Pacific Ocean. And they started to build bases on these small islands. And on these small islands, there were like wild local people living there, right, who had never seen any civilization before. So Americans came, they started to build these um, mission flight towers, radars, laneways for planes to take off and land. So they started also to, you know, build some relations with these local people. They started to give them some kind of a gift. So if you look from like this wild man perspective, there are people flying from the sky, giving us gifts, gods. Right? Yeah. Americans were very happy being called a god, so everything worked fine. So, but the war was over, and Americans went back home, and what happened for these local people? They said, oh my god, the gods are away. We have to do something so they come back. So they started to mimic what they've seen. So they started to build Mission flight tower, mission control towers, radars, laneways for planes, planes even. They started to build all this from anything they could find. From sticks, from clay, from some ropes. And you know, and they thought that Americans will come back. And if we look at this, yeah, it's like, a, <laughs> they are so silly. <laughs> Poor wild people, they never seen a plane, they have no idea how it works. Yeah, they seem so silly. But are we not doing the same thing in our organizations? Aren't we just looking at other pe what other people do and try to mimic the, th the same thing and try to achieve the same result? And I'm not saying that it's bad to look what big players are doing. Guys, it's good to look at Google, Spotify, and so on. These guys are setting trends, but they do all the things for a reason. And how many times I've seen an organization that, oh, we have chapters, tribes, and guilds. 
Why? Because Spotify has them. Cool. We use microservices. Why? Because Netflix is doing microservices. Right? We are automating everything. Why? Because on some conference someone said that it's time to automate. We do the same things, but they do the things for the reason. So the learning from here is that you may introduce new things just because others do, not because you need them. Okay, chapter number four. Chapter number four, envy. Here we meet a very small, very mean, very jealous guy. Who can it be? Sorry? Grinch? No. Here we meet Eric Cartman. So Eric Cartman appears. Screw you guys. Okay? So this little, mean, jealous guy. Eric hates when other people are happier, right? He hates when other people are better. And he hates when actually whatever. He has to be the best. He has to be on top, right? And this is jealousy. This is being just a little mean guy because, you know, you have this Eric Cartman also in our work because sometimes you sit on a meeting, you have to choose some kind of a solution. Are we using this tool or this tool or should we choose a test strategy? And suddenly, someone with the other idea becomes Eric Cartman, right? You can see him. He's like, like angry eyebrows, right? Blinking eyes, clenched lips, and you see, oh, he's going to pop. It will start. The battle begins, right? So we have this Eric Cartman in our work, and they show especially when the discussion begins, right? When discussion begins, we start to have a small conflict, and you know, it's said that we are IT, we are adults, right? We are adults, we should be professional, we should act professional in our work. But when the discussion starts, usually it's more or less like this. We discuss, no, I'm right and you're wrong. And if you want to discuss, okay, let's talk about how wrong you are. This is our professional behavior, right? But another cognitive bias, another thing in our head comes into play when we start discussing, right? And this is called the confirmation bias. And what is the confirmation bias? In general, it says that we as human, we try to look for arguments, we try to look for people that support our vision, and we give much greater value to their opinions. So in general, it's like looking for stuff you agree with. To give you an example, let's say that I, I say, let's go to production without any testing. Ha! Huh. And you say, for example, should we go to production without testing? No. Okay, we have a conflict. Perfect. So what, if you have a conflict in your job, what you do? You ask for a second opinion, of course. So let's ask someone. Alexandra, please. We should we go to the production without testing? Okay, so yes. Mm, um, you're a junior, sorry. <laughs> you, need to, you need to learn a lot, okay? Sorry, you please. Should we go to production without testing? Are you hiring already juniors here? Come on, Langley. It's you. Yes. Oh, sh there's the expert, guys. And this is confirmation bias. <laughs> I will now give her the greatest value I can because she supports me. And I will give you less value just because you don't agree with me. And this is how we work in conflict. And, and this is how our brain works. So the learning in here is, thank you very much. <laughs> so the learning from here is that you may ignore the best idea just because it's not yours. So choose her's idea. <laughs> OK. Chapter number four die, done. Let's go to chapter number five. Chapter number five, gluttony. Who can we meet in here? Who can we meet in here? A really big guy. Who? Not, not Hawk. Big in terms of, you know, size. <laughs> okay, from one of my favorite cartoons from Family Guy, Peter Griffin. So Peter Griffin appears. This is a guy who loves to eat, right? He's not fat, obviously. However, in one episode, it was proven that he has his own gravitational field, right? But let's skip that. OK, so Peter ate a lot. And gluttony, in general, is about eat as much as you can. Eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And what we do in our projects, what we love to consume, what we want to have more and more and more. I told you I'm not going to talk about money today. <laughs> Tools. 
We love to have tools, right? We put more and more tools. Why? No idea, it just increases the complexity, but we love to have them. Different framework for this, different framework for that, new process for this, and so on. And when we are full, when we are absolutely full that gluttony comes into play, we eat even more. If we don't have any more tools to put into the project, we have a better idea, right? Evelinka has a better idea. There are no tools for me, so I have a better idea. I will craft my own tools. I will do my own framework, okay? And every conference I go, I hear like, don't do your own framework. Then I talk with some companies and what they do, they do their own frameworks. <laughs> so it's like happening all the time. Any, anyone, you work in a company that doesn't do their own frameworks, anyone in here? No hands up. I can say the same. We also did the same mistake. We build our own frameworks. So why we do it? We build these own frameworks and we stick to them. We love them. They are so good because we have the problems in the world that no one has. We will change. We are the new Elon Musk. We will solve performance testing. Come on. So why do we keep stuck with these own tools? And this picture, I think, should help you a little bit. This is the IKEA store. It's one in Poland. I was looking for one in Ukraine, but uh, as I've read, they are coming to Ukraine in 2019, so next year. So this is one in Poland, and I wanted to tell you about something which is called the IKEA effect here. Name from the shop, because if you look at IKEA, their products are not top quality. They are also not that cheap, but you have to take them home and build it on your own. And that's the key. This is why they are still probably one, number one furniture retailer in the world. Because you have to make them on your own. And this is the psychological effect called for IKEA because we say we put greater value on our own creations. This means that if you buy a chair from IKEA, you take it home, you put it all together, it's somehow crooked. It's not comfortable, but it's yours. Right? It's yours. You are the man in the house. Yeah? You build a chair. Congrats. Right? It's like hunting a lion 2,000 years ago. Or 3,000 years. Okay, so, so we put greater value to our own creations. And that's the thing. This is why we keep stuck. We don't look at the real value of the, our own framework. And we tend to stick with them because they're ours, because there's so, so many things and so on. So the learning we have from here is that more is not better, definitely not in terms of tools, processes, and so on. And your tool may be not the best one. You may think so because it's yours, but it may not be true. So, chapter number five is done. Let's go to chapter number six. Chapter number six is wrath, anger. Who can we meet in here? A guy with really strong anger management issues. Now we meet Hulk. Now we meet Hulk, Hulk smash. This is a guy who when got nervous, the problems were starting, right? Usually you can somehow keep your anger to yourself. He was destroying everything. Anger management issues. Okay, so we meet Hulk, who is destroying stuff because he gets angry. And when I started to think about anger in general, it was very hard for me to make it from the psychology to behaviors that we can observe in our work. And I started to read a bit about anger, and I read that anger is actually a natural emotion protecting you. Protecting you from what? Protecting you from something considered wrong. So it means that if something happens, it's not like we are in our work and we come to the office at 9, we are angry, we are leaving at 5, we're angry. I, at least I hope so. If, if you are in such a place, maybe it's time to change your work. But usually something happens, we get angry. Right? And then I started to read about this, and this is due to another bias that sits in our head, and this is called the deflection to the result. What is deflection to the result? It's a natural tendency for us as human beings to look at the result only, ignoring the entire context. To give you an example, right? Let's assume you see a guy with a brand new iPhone, the super new, this crazily expensive one, right? And let's, for this example, assume that iPhone is a good phone, okay? Just for a moment. So you see a guy with a brand new iPhone, and it's a good phone, so you say like, oh man, you made a great decision, right? You bought this, this is a bit expensive, but man, this is a great phone. But if you knew, for example, that this guy sold his kidney to buy this phone, because it's probably same value, then you would say like, man, this is so stupid decision. 
maybe it's not the stupidest thing I've ever heard, but probably top 10 at least, right? And this is deflection to the result. We look at the result, we ignore the context. And we have some results, right? We see something, there is a decision, decision made in our work or something like this. If it's good, yeah, we're happy, it's super cool, everything's fine. If it's bad, nah, here's my resignation form, I, I quit. All right, we get super angry. And the problem is that we ignore the rest. We ignore this entire path that led to this decision, that led to this action. And you know what the problem is? That here happens the learning. You cannot learn anything from the result only. You can learn only from the path. So you are missing a huge amount of information. So the learning from here it is that your judgment may be not, not, may not be based may not be based on full information because we as human beings tend to ignore the context. Chapter number seven, sloth, laziness. Who can we meet in here? This side, any ideas? A very lazy guy. Homer Simpson. Homer Simpson is actually sleeping at the moment, so let's not disturb him. He was a lazy guy. Let me show you a quote. I won't ask you who said it because this is obviously one of the Homer Simpson's great thoughts. Trying is the first step towards failure. And if you look at this, this is actually true, right? But like, come on, if you don't, if you try something, yeah, you can fail. So if you don't try, you won't fail. This is actually pretty smart. We're laughing, but this is true. You know what the problem is? The problem is if you don't try anything, you also won't succeed. And that's the problem, because in the IT industry, which is moving so quickly forward, Staying in one place won't get you far. So, and here, if you look at this, another cognitive bias comes into play. Another thing that in our brain kind of stop us, stops us from trying new things. Because let's go to Evelinka. Now Evelinka, in our journey, she stands in front of a junction. And she can choose the old way that she knows very well, and she can choose the new way. Which one will she choose? Definitely. She'll choose the old one because she knows it well, right? And this is what our brain tells us. You know, for thousands of years, our brain had one task. Keep us alive, right? This was the evolution. So our brain created a strategy that worked for last few thousand years, and it was played safe, right? Don't jump from the cliffs. Don't attack with a lion with your bare hands. Because if you try, we don't see much more people, many more people who are jumping from the cliffs, right? Evolution. So our brain had this strategy to play it safe. So when we choose, we have to choose something new, we try to mitigate the risk. We try to go with the old thing we know very well. And this is in psychology called a well-traveled road effect. So our natural tendency to keep to the things we know exactly already, we've been there, we've done that, this is what our brains tell us. The problem is that we can travel through the same road hundreds of times and everything will be fine. But then there will be this 101st time that actually this will be a dead end and we can simply crush. So the learning from this chapter is that using the same way all the time may give you no results. Chapter number seven done. We went through all the deadly sins. So chapter eight. The grand finale. Guys, let's make a confession in here. We sinned, right? We sinned. Come on, how many of you haven't had this Sheldon Cooper moment when you said like, oh, this is how we should do it, I know it, let's just do it like I say and let's go home. Or this lazy Homer Simpson's like, oh my God, why are we discussing this? We, are, we did it like hundreds of times like that, let's just do it. Or this little mean Eric Cartman, you know, like, I want my idea to be implemented. We sinned, yeah? You can, we can admit it. I sinned, you sinned. What we say in this world stays in here and on YouTube, of course, so no one will know it. So we can admit we sinned. We sinned, I sinned, you sinned, Evelinka sinned, and when you sin, you go to hell. Right? It's time for your punishment. And who's in hell? In hell, there is Mr. Devil. And he says, ha, ha, ha. Welcome to hell, you sinner. Time for a punishment, right? But actually, what we've discussed is psychology. These are some cognitive, cognitive, subconscious things, and we weren't aware about it, aware of it. Now, when we know what we can do wrongly because of our brain, wait a minute, Mr. Devil, not so fast. 
Now we can change. Because we've been discussing some bad behaviors, behaviors that are, were affecting the quality, our decisions and the quality of our products in possibly a bad way. Now we can change because we had, we met, first we met Sheldon Cooper, right? Who was so proud, he thought he knew everything. So he was making decisions based on assumptions and this was wrong because he sometimes made mistakes. How can we change this to a good behavior? Well, maybe instead of making decisions based on assumptions, opinions, gut feelings, whatever you call it, maybe it's time to start collecting data and start making data-driven decisions. Not focus on opinions, stop focusing on discussions, start focusing on facts. Then we've met greedy Mr. Burns who wanted everything for himself, every cool task for himself, right? And he wasn't achieving all he wanted. How can we change this? Working as a team. Maybe it's finally, you know, I know developers, yeah, we hate them, you hate them, I was one some time. But now I'm a manager, so it's probably even worse, you hate me more. But guys, maybe it's time for developers, QAs, managers, PEOs, VAs, whoever you have there, to start talking to each other, working together to achieve the shared goal. Next, we've met lustful Barney Stinson, who wanted everything so much that he was affected by the cargo cult. He was taking, he was mimicking what he's seen somewhere else and trying to achieve the same effect and it wasn't working. So what can, now we can do? Well, instead of just mimicking stuff, we can start with why. By the way, a great book from Simon Sinek, strongly recommend. Start with why. First, ask yourself, ask yourself a question. Why do we need this? Next, we've met mean, jealous Eric Cartman. A little help here? <laughs> okay, so we met a mean, I'll try to fix it in the same time. <laughs> We've met a mean little Eric Cartman, right? Who was so jealous that in every discussion he needed to have his idea. And where's the, I dropped the. <laughs> I dropped the clicker, not the laptop. Okay. Oh. Witcher is also a cool game, strongly recommend it. <laughs> okay, so we met Eric Cartman, who was wanting to have these ideas to be implemented, so he was jealous, affected by the confirmation bias, looking for arguments that were supporting his visions. So now what we can do, if we can data, if we have data, now we can start to measure things, we can start to measure everything. Again, a great book. If you can read it, you should definitely do it. Next, we've met fat big boy Peter Griffin, who was eating and eating and putting these tools to his project and crafting his own tools and sticking to them because of the IKEA effect. He was giving the greater value to his own creations. But now if you have data, if you apply metrics, you can start to measure things and you can start to evaluate real value. Not what you think, it's like, oh, this is good, this is bad. No, you can start to evaluate things based on metrics, based on data. Next, we've met Hulk. Hulk who was angry, who was smashing everything because he was focusing on the results only due to deflection to the result. But now when we know that we have this tendency to ignore the context, well, maybe it's time to stop looking at your piece of project. Maybe it's time to start looking at the big picture understanding what we do, what we want to achieve. Not just, this is my task, I end up at five and I go home. Next, we've met lazy, sleeping Homer Simpson, who was choosing all the time the same way because he was so lazy and he was affected by the well-traveled traveled road effect. So what now we can do differently? Well, if we have data, we start with why, we start to measure things, we have the big picture, we can start to run small, well-defined experiments we can start to bring changes, we can start to make changes in our organization in a smart, small way that is giving value, return of investment quickly. And now when we have all the good behaviors, we have all the good behaviors we've talked about, we can finally start to building. We can build, basing on this behavior, we can build something really great. This good behavior, so saying once again, data-driven decisions, working as a team, starting with why, measuring everything, evaluating real value, seeing the big picture and running experiments. Basing on these behaviors, you can start to build something that I like to call the quality culture. And you can start to build the quality culture in your team and then moving to what I love, somehow an evangelist, 
you can start to build this quality culture inside your organization from the bottom to the top. And then when you have this quality as a part of your culture, you have the quality as the way of working, you will never have to ask these simple questions like, should we test this? Or should we, do we have time to test this? No, the quality will be in the part of your culture, in the part of the way, way you work. And if you are in such place, which I wish you, of course, because this is a great place for a QA, you will grow, you will be satisfied with your work, and you will have do amazing things, amazing products. And this quality being a part of our culture, this is what I wish you today, and that's it from me. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, I'm here for you. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you for presentation. Thank uh, you. Uh, you, uh, you were talking about uh, don't take uh, all interesting for yourself, and uh, how to do when you should delegate the task. If you delegate all interesting stuff for the other people, how you should motivate yourself? Uh, the question is why you delegate. Uh, if you are a leader, for example, and you delegate stuff, that's kind of normal, right? If you, if, if you are a leader, and probably now the fancy thing is servant leadership, so you probably focus more on growing people in your team, people you work with, and you have to find the motivation in that. If you're not motivated as a leader to help your people grow, then you won't grow and you won't be a good leader. So that's one thing. The other perspective is if you are working as a QA technical person, right? So then why you don't? You should be working all together as a team and sharing all the interesting stuff, sharing all the boring stuff. So you are all together in it. So I don't know if this is the answer you were looking for. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh if you have interesting and urgent tasks, and you have boring, urgent tasks, which one you will delegate to the team? Um, and if you, <laughs> if you don't have time to to do both, and if you always pick boring stuff for yourself, uh, how you should motivate yourself? Okay. I, I understand your stuff about growing the team. I, I'm talking about from Liz. Okay, mm, when I was a team leader. Uh, and we were sharing tasks all together. I was usually taking the boring stuff. I was giving the cool things to the team. They were achieving this. And then I was, you know, in the second line, just like, it was me as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was usually delegating the boring stuff. Plus, I didn't have that much time. If you're working like technically and you in a technical field and you also have plenty of other things, then probably take the boring little tasks rather than the important ones because probably you can make cre create a delay because of your availability. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? There, behind the pillar. There, there's, like, there's a guy <laughs> waving his hand. <laughs> Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I think it will be a very common question according to this presentation. That is a sin of all of them. Ah, of all of them. Because the most common question is deadliest, deadliest sin of me. <laughs> Aaron, Not this asking, time. You know, Maybe as, a, as an additional question. <laughs> People love this public punishment. <laughs> okay, the deadliest sin. Um, uh, this is a good question and I would say particularly none of them. Uh, but this, if you look at all these things, if, if you, you know, like, try to be the smartest one, or you think you are the smartest one, or you take stuff, or whatever you do, this affects the most important thing of all, and this is trust. And lack of trust is our greatest sin, I think, in the organizations, because if you don't have trust, the collaboration fails, the delivery fails, the quality fails, everything starts to fail if you don't have the trust, if you don't have the right collaboration. So I would say this is the deadliest sin, and all of this we've been talking, the kind of exact behaviors are kind of, you know, hurting trust in the team. Because if you have a friend in your team, a colleague, who is, for example, 
always taking the best stuff, or he's always trying to put his ideas first, he's not looking at the team. You won't trust this guy. So the collaboration will fail, you will start to fail as a team. So all these behaviors are affecting trust in the end. And uh, I believe, and my deadliest sin? <laughs> Depends. I think for a moment uh, I was a Sheldon Cooper, of course, as everyone who is starting the career in the IT, right? There's this point after usually a year or two when you think you know everything, yeah? It's like, pfft, everything is just so simple, right? So, so I was affected by this as well. Then I realized that mm, probably no. <laughs> but um, maybe a little bit of Eric Cartman. I like to like put my ideas on top, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. And the additional one, uh, you mentioned Zen representation, so build your own way to make equality and uh, start to use something useful. Uh, wouldn't be uh, this is as similar as build your own framework in some cases? By framework, by tools, I mean I meant in the pre like purely technical solutions, right? Because we always do this. If you look at the companies, um, whatever we do, the way of working, culture, it is some kind of a framework, right? We somehow work. You can, we have some, at least some processes. Sometimes a lot of them, sometimes very few, but but it can be called some kind of a framework. So the question is, you know, what level of abstraction do you mean? Because you should achieve, you have to achieve some goals, right? There are customers who are paying for your work. They're paying for the quality. And the question is what they need and how do you provide it so they are still willing to pay you. <laughs> so, so this is, you build somehow the, the collaboration, it can, be a, it can be called a framework and every organization has to have it on their own. Here I was talking more, a little bit more about uh, like purely technical stuff like another performance testing tool or another cloud monitoring tool, which we did for example. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thanks again. Thank uh, so my question is, uh, in your presentation you spoke more about how to eliminate the scenes effects, right? And um, as you have said, it's our psychology, so it's like in our core. Uh, maybe there is a way to make these scenes work for a project because it's very hard to change human behavior, right? So maybe it's way, for example, take your cargo cult effect, right? And uh, try something new, 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 and in the result get something that works for you. Or it may go for another things you mentioned. How uh, do you think? Is it possible? Or Yeah, I, I actually this is a very good comment slash question. Yeah, you're absolutely right and I agree with 100%. We won't change it. This is how our brain works. We, we won't eliminate confirmation bias. It's like, you know, you have to you know, cut off part of your brain or something like that. Come on. <laughs> so we won't eliminate, eliminate that totally. Only what we can do, we can be aware that this thing happens. And we can be aware that, for example, if I have like this thought, well, maybe it's because, I don't know, my experience, my knowledge, it's not based on any fact. So we can just raise awareness that we work like this, we behave like this subconsciously and try to have these moments of reflection. Are we making the right decision and so on. And, and as is everything, Kurt Calgo, Cargo Cult is not a sin itself. As I said, there's nothing wrong to look what other companies are doing. Come on, we at Ocado, we really look, look at how Google works and we try to apply this but it's not like we want to be a second Google because we are a totally different company. We have different position, we have different projects. We cannot do the same thing as they do and suddenly be successful. So this, all these things will happen, but it's up to you if you make good of it or you just follow it blindly, right? So you, for example, Google does that, let's do it. No asking any questions, we're doing this like this. Now, it's, if you do this, but ask yourself why, all fine. You can base your your decisions of your on your opinions on your knowledge. Sometimes you don't have choice. You don't have data, but if you can use data and your knowledge and your experience, that's great. So 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 this is my point. Those are things we work like this, and if we want focus, we can you know make some mistakes. But 
if you have this common sense, you, you do it like, you know, with common sense, you can achieve much more. There was another question. Yeah. Uh, hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question which is a bit similar to a previous one. It's about uh, cargo cult. So uh, you said that uh, big companies uh, do, things, uh, do things for a reason. And uh, what about just um, uh, looking at such uh, samples, just uh, an analyzing uh, them, and uh, like taking into in, into consideration uh, mistakes which they made, or just uh, what went well, what was not so good, and uh, validate this in the team. Uh, would such approach uh, work? Uh, uh, what do you, how do you think? Okay, so. To, to achieve this, what you're yeah. asking, uh, to take this stuff from other companies, you know, it's called inspiration, right? Or big yeah. idea. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so you can do it. Everyone does it. Um, the thing is that if you would say, for example, okay, we won't do this because, for example, Netflix is doing so. so, and you try to do it, you don't gather data, you don't measure stuff, you can end up, for example, wasting a year. Actually, yeah, but uh, if you just uh, provide. Um have some ideas and you present them to the team and discuss so uh, then it will turn out uh, very soon that um, um, in case you are moving in the wrong direction so just uh, that's what I mean and just then communicate yeah this means you're doing experiments right yeah but to do experiments you need to have certain conditions right probably it would be good to have data probably good to have some kind analysis of criteria some analysis if you just do it, okay, I have this idea, it's great, let's discuss it, we all agree, okay, let's do a year of this. I, yeah. I don't know, let's stop going to work for a year. Everyone will be happy, right? The team will say, oh, this is the best idea ever. Uh, but, okay, I'm, j I'm joking, of course. Yeah, yeah, I said, But you know, if uh, you have data, if you have all these things, then you have the, the, the environment to actually run experiments. Because I've seen plenty of this, right? Companies tend to do something, and after a half a year, a year, they say, Oh, we failed. Oh, but we learned a lot. But actually, but uh, uh, so, uh, they could have uh, understood, understand this a bit earlier. So uh, after uh, checking the results, like uh, from the first try trials, they can. But they didn't. <laughs> they can. But how many examples do you have of internal frameworks in companies that are there for a year and two because no one looked at them and say, okay, we are failing. Let's stop it. Let's continue. There will be effects because we don't do metrics, we don't do data. So, you know, it's, it's like all these things, they're helping you to run smart experiments and realize, for example, that you're doing something wrong much earlier. Because, yeah, in perfect world, you realize very quickly that you, you did something wrong, you roll back it, and so on. But in real life, it's not always yeah, like it, that. it seems that uh, a, uh, some control is required here because, um, like, if you control this process, if you're doing something wrong, just uh, find it uh, and uh, fix it. I would be crazily careful with the control because if you, for example, have a manager that has this idea of a perfect framework you should do, everyone's been there, right? Your manager says, This is the perfect way to do it. And he says, No, it's not working. No, 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 this is a great idea, do it. No, but you see, it's not working. No, but it's my idea. You do it. <laughs> Managers have this tendency. So I'll be very afraid of control here. I think the data metrics, something you cannot discuss with. And then you can just collect data and uh, provide it uh, uh, to the manager. Just uh, present uh, your uh, ideas in such a way. Maybe it will help. <laughs> Yeah, this is collecting data, data driven. Yeah. I think okay. we're running out of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Actually, our time is closed. But you can speak with Tomasz after the meeting. Yeah, I'm here around. <laughs> Thank you. Speech. And so now we need to decide what was the most interesting question for this session. I definitely I think I like the most the comment about psychology from Grelder. Okay, we will give it to this lady. Thanks again, Tomasz. It was amazing. Thank you Thank very you. much.